Hello, friends, and welcome to our Sabbath School panel. We are studying End Time Deceptions, lesson number 11 of the quarter, which is entitled Life Everlasting, Death Dying, and the Future Hope. My name is James Rafferty, and I'm joined here by a panel of Sabbath School lesson students. And we are so excited that you joined us because this quarter has been filled with very important messages from the Word of God that are going to help us in these last days, especially today we're going to be looking at end time deceptions. So to my left, my immediate left, is Pastor John Denzi. It's a blessing to be here. You know, Monday has the title Near Death Experiences. Very interesting. All right, and <laughs> Shelley Quinn. I have Tuesdays, and it's the Deception of Reincarnation. Okay, mm. all right. Mm. And Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Necromancy and Ancestor mm. Worship. Woo! Mm. And Jill Marconi. I have personations and other appearances. Amen. So you can see we have a, a full roster of very important messages that are coming to us from the lesson study this week. We're so glad again that you've joined us. We're going to get right into our lesson just after we have a word of prayer. Jill, would you like to have a word of prayer sure. for us? Thank you. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for the truth found in your word. We thank you that your truth sets us free. And right now, as we study this important topic and topics, we pray that you would open up our minds and hearts and set us free in Jesus name. Amen. 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 End time deception. Sabbath afternoon gives us an overview of the lesson for the quarter. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 27. Also, John 11, 40 to 44, 1 Peter 3, verse 18, and 1 Samuel 28, verses 3 to 25, as well as Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. And of course, we'll be looking at a more scripture than that, but these are the basic scriptures we'll be looking at for our lesson. Our memory text is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Here's what the memory text says. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, their end will match their deeds. Mm. Mm. So this is, really, this is really amazing when you think about it that Satan comes as an angel of light. Sometimes we think of Satan, you know, mm. some kind of red beastly looking thing with a tail right. and a pitchfork and horns coming out of his head and, you know, kind of a scary image. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that Satan comes as an angel of light mm. and his ministers come as ministers of righteousness. In the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it tells us that they're coming to preach not antichrist, but another Jesus, uh, not Satanism, but another gospel. And they're coming with another spirit. In other words, they're coming in a Christian guise. Right. That's what the Bible teaches us. Yeah. And that's why it's so deceptive. That's why it's so important for us to understand how Satan is working in these last days. Now, Cordley goes on to say that our contemporary world has become a melting pot of supernatural and the mystical, helped on by Hollywood, which has no problem making movies with religious and mystical themes, with a hodgepodge of error and deception. The old lie, ye surely will not die, Genesis 3 verse 4, has also inspired some of the most read books and the most watched movies of the last decades mm -hmm. and many popular videos as well. Undeniably, we are exposed to and tempted by the enchanted ground of Satan. He is coming like Christ as the prince of this world and appears in different forms and even in some cases he comes in the hidden veneer of science. The lesson goes on to say one of the most deceptive phenomena that has been uh, uh, seen in these last days is called near-death experiences, what we call NDEs. And it says that those who have died and have come back to life to tell the stories of the afterlife. Have you heard of those? I see those almost every week uh -huh. as I'm, I'm looking through media, social media. Many people have seen these events as proof or see these events as proof of 
immortal life or the immortal soul, I should say. During this week, we're going to consider some of these end time deceptions. We're going to be looking at mysticism, at near-death experiences, at reincarnation, at necromancy, at ancestor worship and others. And we're going to see that these are deceptive subjects that we need to be aware of without exposing ourselves to their influences. It's very important that we keep a safe distance from some of these subjects, but it's also that we're aware of these subjects and what the Bible says about them. Mm -hmm. And hopefully our panel is gonna help us to do that. Our Sunday's lesson is called Mysticism. Mm -hmm. Mysticism is in our world, it's flooding our world. Our world is flooded with mysticism. And this <laughs> word mysticism is a complex term that encapsulates a huge variety of ideas. From a religious perspective, however, the word implies the union of the individual with a divine or absolute power of some kind, some kind of, of absolute power in a spiritual experience or trance. The Quarterly goes on to say, this characterizes the worship experience of even certain churches. Hmm. The phenomena can, be, can vary in form and intensity, but the tendency always is to replace the authority of the written word of God by one's own subjective experience. In any case, the Bible loses much of its doctrinal function and the Christian remains vulnerable to his or her own experience. And this kind of subjective religion does not provide a safeguard against any deception, especially the end time ones. So based on this understanding of mysticism, I want us to look at Genesis chapter three, because that's where we see the first example, the yeah. practical example of mysticism, what it looks like. So we're gonna look at Genesis chapter three, and we're just gonna read quickly verses one through six. Genesis 3, 1 through 6 is a description of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, verse 5, then your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, and here it is. Here is the experience of mysticism. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So what Eve is doing here is she's going beyond the protection of the word of God. She's going beyond the protection of a thus saith the Lord and she's starting to go by her experiences, by her feelings, by what she sees, by what she feels, by what she desires. This is mysticism. Mysticism is this, this complex combination of spiritual and emotional and feelings and what you think, how you think God is leading you and what you think God is saying to you. And, oh, God must not have, the, the serpent might be right. I probably won't, no, this is, I don't feel like, it seems like this is a desirable fruit. And a lot of Christians, unfortunately, do that in their experience. They have an experience that's mingled partly with the word of God and partly with their emotions and their feelings. We see this, for example, with the Sabbath. You know, God has specifically told us the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Christians call it the Lord's Day. You know, that's the day that Jesus rose. I, th I think that's probably the appropriate day to go to church. I think that's probably the appropriate day to worship God because, because after all, that's the day God rose and the Lord rose and that's the day that the disciples came together. And I just feel like, uh, you know, I desire that is, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's partly based on the word of God and it's yeah. partly based on the way we feel and the way we yeah. think. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 27, mm -hmm. that it's important for us yes. to build upon our foundation upon a rock. So these are the, the scriptures that we're going to be looking at here in the last few minutes that we have on this particular day, Sabbath and Sunday. Jesus says here in Matthew 7, verse, verse, verses 24 to 27, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, I want to just emphasize the point here, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that hears these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Mm. 
God does not want us to have this great fall of this house that he is building. And, and this house represents the foundation of truth, of belief, of experience right. that God wants us to have in his word. And God is saying, you can't just hear my word. Eve heard the word of God. Adam heard the word of God, but you also need to do those words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stay away from that tree. Don't partake of that tree. That tree is going to lead you to death and guilt. It's not going to lead you to life everlasting. And so God is calling us to do the same, to learn from the lesson of Adam and Eve, not to fall into this mystical experience of going by our feelings and our emotions, but go by the rock solid word of God. I love this picture of the rock because it's the same picture we see in Daniel chapter two, the rock that smites this image of all of these different kingdoms at the feet, brings it down and then fills the whole earth. And that rock represents, of course, Jesus Christ and it represents the kingdom of God. So there is a strong tendency in this postmodern Christian world to downplay the relevance of biblical doctrines. The quarterly goes on to say, regarding them as tedious echoes of an absolute form of religion. In this process, the teachings of Christ are artificially replaced by the person of Christ arguing, for instance, that some biblical story or another cannot be true because Jesus, as they perceive him, would never have allowed that to happen as it is written. Personal feelings, taste end up being the criteria for interpreting the scriptures or even for rejecting outright what the Bible clearly teaches. Often, uh, what, God, what the Bible teaches about obedience to God or what Jesus said is essential to building one house, building one's house around the, upon the rock is discarded. We just lay it aside. Well, because it just doesn't seem right. It, it doesn't seem like Jesus would ever say that. It doesn't seem like God would ever do that. And we discard the plain teaching of God's word. Those who think that it matters not what they believe in doctrine, so long as they believe in God, Jesus Christ are on dangerous ground. Remember, the Roman inquisitors who condemned to death un told numbers of Protestants believed in God, they believed in Jesus. Mm. Those who cast out demons in Christ's name in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, have believed in God. The Jewish leaders and the people who crucified Christ believed in God. Mm. There are many Christians today who break the Ten Commandments and yet they believe in God. Mm. So the position that it's of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful successful deceptions. The author of the quarterly goes on to say, he knows that the truth received and love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, and another gospel. So how can we fight this human tendency to let our emotions and our desires cause us to do things contrary to the word of God? Well, to me, the key is we need to let the word of God be the authority in our lives. Amen. Right. Thus saith the Lord has to be the foundation of everything we do, everything we teach and everything we believe. And only in that way will we be safe. We could say it this way. We need to let the scriptures be our safeguard. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. So we now move to Monday's portion of the lesson. And the title is Near Death Experiences. And we want to... Uh, encourage you to follow carefully because uh, these experiences um, happen, uh, they say, uh, very often to people that are near death. Mm -hmm. And there are people on the internet, YouTube, etc., that are sharing their experiences. Mm -hmm. So the lesson brings out that uh, a book came out in the 70s where this person is uh, detailing what happens to people with near death experiences. So the thing about this is that some of these people come back saying they have seen a bright in the light and going through a tunnel and a person uh, very bright. Uh, so how do, we, how do we look at this and what is the importance of this and should it have anything as far, anything of value for us as far as considering what happens after you die? Mm -hmm. I'd like to bring to, you, to your attention that the People that have these experiences, uh, I found something very interesting mm -hmm. that I'd like to share with you in a moment. Uh, something recent that happened because most of the experiences that are detailed are uh, 
interviews they have had with people where they are telling what they saw. And some of these people saw themselves, I saw myself on the operating table and people operating on me and they were floating. Some of these people are floating into the air. Some of them are talking about going through a tunnel. The thing about this is that the lesson says they come, a lot of these people that claim to have some kind of a religious experience and these near death experiences, they come away less inclined toward Christianity than they were before having died because they approach death and then they come back and they tell their experiences. Scientific American, it's a very well known magazine that reports on scientific issues and they say NDEs, near death experiences, can either be positive or negative and most of the people don't want to share the negative ones. Mm. Uh, the ones that uh, make the news are the ones that say, I saw, a, I saw Jesus. Or, and some of these people see dead relatives mm -hmm. that speak to them. Mm. So when we compare this with scripture, where the Bible says the dead know not anything, we have to ask ourselves, okay, what are these people seeing? So it says the former receive all the press, that is the positive ones, and relate to the feeling of an overwhelming press and something numinous, divine. A jarring disconnect separates the massive trauma to the body and the peacefulness and feeling of oneness with the universe. Yet not all NDEs are blissful. Some can be frightening, mm -hmm. marked by intense terror, anguish, loneliness, and despair. And the people feel like they're, they don't have control over the situation. Uh, it says here that it must be remembered that NDEs have been with us at all times, in all cultures, and in all people, young and old, devout and skeptical. skeptical. Uh, and it says here, the so-called Tibetan Book of the Dead, which describes the mind before and after death, to those raised in religious traditions, notice, religious traditions, Christians or otherwise, the most obvious explanation is that they were granted a vision of heaven or hell of what awaits them in the hereafter. And the thing I wanted to bring out is a very interesting study that was done. They were, the, the thing about these near-death experiences is that nobody knows when somebody is going to have one. Right. So to get the uh, brain activity, what's going on, has been very difficult mm -hmm. till this year. Uh, a report came out in February. And this is what I like to bring out to you. It says, for the first time, scientists have captured the brain activity of a person during their death. The study occurred by accident. Hmm. The researchers were analyzing the brain activity of an epilepsy patient when, they, when he unexpectedly died. The findings may shed light on what occurs during near-death experiences. And so this is what they say. The fact that the people, um, the finding, they say that we measured 900 seconds of brain activity around the time of death and set a specific focus to investigate what happened in the 30 seconds before and after the heart stopped beating. And the study organizer Ajmar Zemar, a neurosurgeon at the University of Louisville said in the press release, and this is what they say, the brain wave patterns they saw in the minute heart stop beating are usually involved in high cognitive functions and activities such as dreaming, Hmm. memory recall, and meditation. So the, uh, the near-death experiences in reality are based on things you have been exposed to, hopes, and fears. And this is why some people have negative ones and some people have positive ones because if you're a religious nature, oh, your hope is, oh, I will meet Jesus, etc. But some of these people are said to meet dead relatives. So this brings to us a caution that there is danger in putting value into this as far as your Christian belief. So the Bible should be our basis for what we believe in, not what somebody explains to you. This is what I saw because the people that say they saw these things, I remember very clearly. A young lady telling me that uh, she went to this church and they told her, hey, you're going to get married in six months. You're going to meet the man of your dreams and et cetera. So I said, uh, are you, are you, do, you, do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> no. Uh, so it was a matter of waiting a few months mm -hmm. and the young lady was still single. I said, I started to pray because, you know, the devil can... Mm -hmm. play with people's minds and bring in somebody that will cause you great harm. And she thinks, this must be the guy, this must be the guy. And uh, it's a very dangerous thing. 
This is uh, something that we need to take into account. When these experiences that people share with you, near death experiences, what does the Bible say? In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 and 12, we must remember that God created a beautiful angel called Lucifer mm -hmm. that eventually rebelled against God's government. And the Bible says that he was the seal of perfection, mm -hmm. full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Unfortunately, he is using that wisdom to deceive. Mm. So 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15 says, and no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Right. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. This is why Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, beware of false prophets and false Christ. That's right. Mm -hmm. So Revelation 13, verse 11 through 14 also brings out that uh, we're going to be facing a very dangerous time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am going to read a few verses, uh, just verse 13 and 14 because of lack of time. Uh, it talks here about a beast. It says he performs great signs so that he even makes fire mm -hmm. come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So when we evaluate these near death, uh, de death experiences, we need to consider what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 820 says to the law and to the testimony, mm -hmm. if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Mm. So when they tell you they saw a dead relative and the dead relative said, this is what you should do, this is what uh, is going to happen, go to the Bible. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9 and 10, 10 says, whom will he teach knowledge and whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept and precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So we need to compare this with scripture. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's what we need to trust, the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, mm -hmm. that the man and woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Mm. Now the lesson brings out several individuals that were raised from the dead. And the lesson brings out the question, none, a, a statement, none of these people come back telling us hmm. of experiences mm -hmm. they've had. They're pretty much silent. The Bible doesn't really uh, detail what happens afterwards, but these people do not come back saying things that they uh, saw dead relatives or any of these uh, type of things. So we need to compare these things with scripture because the Bible is what we need to base our beliefs on mm -hmm. and not anyone's experiences. And this is why uh, I bring to you now Psalm 115 verse 17, because some of these people see near death experiences that they do not praise the Lord nor any they go down into silence. Mm -hmm. Psalm uh, uh, 146, three and four, do not put your trust in princes nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returned to his earth in that day his plans mm -hmm. perish. perish. So let's base these things on what the Bible says. Amen, Johnny, I really like that. You know, it's amazing to me how God has put real death experiences in the Old Testament, we talked about that earlier, and in the New Testament, and all of them, including the one with Lazarus, dead four days, come back with absolutely no NDE. So God has given us protection in His Word. That's where we find protection. And we're gonna see more and more of this as we continue to study this subject. So don't go away, we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back, friends. We're continuing our study on end-time deceptions, and we're handing it over to Shelley Quinn. 
Thank you so much for this beginning. And I have to say something. I appreciate what you said about what we are doing here is we're looking at it, but don't make this your focus of, we need to avoid too much exposure. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about Adam and Eve, when Eve was in the garden, you know, the serpent wasn't a snake until the Lord cursed it. It didn't slither on its belly. Right. But when Eve comes and she's there and she looks up and sees this serpent, Satan was using the serpent as a medium and all of Satan's dazzling beauty. And all of a sudden she, it catches her eye. And then you know what happened? Her big mistake was Satan started talking to her through that serpent. Her mistake was she engaged in a conversation mm. with him. Mm -hmm. So we gotta be careful about how engaged we get. Yeah. I have reincarnation and the theory of reincarnation I don't know if I said my name, I'm Shelley Quinn, I think. <laughs> but the theory of reincarnation, this transmigration of the, of the spirit or the soul or whatever they call it, from one being to a next is definitely not biblical. It is founded on the pagan notion that the soul is immortal. Yes. First Timothy 6.16 tells us God alone has immortality at this time. Mm -hmm. And then we've been looking. First Corinthians 15, 51 through 57 says we put on immortality at Christ's second coming. So this theory though of being rebirthed into many different images, this is something that some major mm -hmm. uh, world religions, especially say the Hindus. Hindus believe that there are six classes of life and that the eternal soul is on this journey towards perfection. So here's what they, they, they say. It's a progression of consciousness called samsara and that you first start aquatics, plants, reptiles, or insects. Then you go to birds, animals, human beings, and including residents of heaven. But the Bible teaches that God has appointed humanity to die once. And when we think about this, mm -hmm. the Bible teaches that God came down in the person of Jesus Christ and he became like us in every way. Mm -hmm. How many times did Jesus die? Once. Once. Mm -hmm. First Peter 3, 18, he suffered once for sin. Mm -hmm. And then Hebrews 7, 27, he died once for all when he offered up himself. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews 9 because this is where we're going to see what goes on with us as well. Hebrews 9, verse 12 says that uh, he with his own blood, he went once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now let's look at verse 25. It says, not that, Hebrews 9, 25, not that he should often offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. Let's hit the pause button there. In the sanctuary service, uh, when God appointed a priesthood, only the high priest could go into the most holy place. And that was only once a year. And he took in, uh, he went into the Holy of Holies once a year with the blood of a sacrificial animal. And did they receive forgiveness? Yes. He was giving this for the people. They received forgiveness, but it only lasted it was only forgiveness for that year. So every year they had to go yes. through the same routine. And the sacrificial system was symbolic, pointing to Christ to let people know that they needed the Messiah, this substitute. Mm. But the blood, the Bible says, the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. But when God came down mm. and became a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He lived as a, a human being for 33 years on this earth. His blood was sufficient to take away 
all sin. Right. So let's look. Verse 26, it's saying, uh, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And verse 27, and as it is appointed for men to die, how often? Once. 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 Yeah. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for mm -hmm. salvation. So Jesus Yes, God was incarnated in the flesh, but his death, it was once mm -hmm. in all of history, it was permanently effective. Mm -hmm. He came here to deal with the penalty of sin, to taste that second death for us. Look at Hebrews 9, 27 once more. And as it is appointed, for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Since Adam's fall, we see that the penalty of physical death has, is what he's talking about. People have appointed once to die once. You're not appointed necessarily to experience the second death, which is in hell. That's where it comes in. Have I accepted Christ or not? We only see very few exceptions. We see actually two. Enoch and Elijah are the only two people that didn't die uh, uh, and were translated to heaven, so they didn't die once. John 5, 28 and 29. <laughs> I love that scripture. Mm -hmm. Jesus Good. says, do not marvel. And let me tell you why I love it. I'm reading to my sister as I was writing a book one time and I, I quoted this where Jesus said, do not marvel at this for the hours coming in which all in the grave will hear his voice and some will come up, those who've been righteous and done good, they come up to the resurrection of life. Then he says, those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And I'm reading on and my sister says, wait, wait a minute, back up. Read that again. What do you mean, everybody that's in their grave? Mm -hmm. So I started explaining it to her. <laughs> oh, she was so upset with me. She was screaming at me. I'm never going to talk to you again. You're saying my mama's not in heaven. And she carried on. And in the midst of the screaming, I said, get your concordance out. Do a study on sleep, on death, and, uh, you know, on resurrection. And, and she said, I'll never talk to you again and hung up. Mm -hmm. Five hours later, she calls me. She's been studying and she said, you're right. <laughs> the Bible says when we die, there's no consciousness. It's compared to a sleep. You're right. There's two resurrections. You're right. Just like that with five hours of study, mm -hmm. she was totally convinced. So he's saying it's appointed for men to die once. When you look at the idea of reincarnation, it contradicts the Bible's teaching on the mortality of the soul. We're mortal beings. Mm -hmm. It contradicts and negates the doctrine of salvation by grace. If you're constantly coming back, trying to purify yourself, it's, it's replacing the redemptive work of of Christ. It contradicts this idea that the eternal destiny, the Bible tells us the way we live our lives, we're choosing our eternal destiny. It is decided while we're living and it downplays the meaning and the relevance of Christ's second coming. And it's, it proposes these after death opportunities, like you're going to get another chance right. if you blow this one. <laughs> and the Bible, we see it's appointed men once to die and then we will be judged. So in short, there is no place for the idea of reincarnation in the Christian faith. 
Amen. Amen. Now it's very well put. Thank you, Shelley, for that. Amen. I have a lesson 11. My name is Ryan Day, and it's entitled Necromancy and Ancestor Worship. And I have to read just a little bit of the beginning portion of this lesson because it really sets it up nicely. The word necromancy, that's a word you don't hear much. You don't hear people talk about it. Yeah. Although I, you know, we, in my household, uh, you know, me and my wife kind of get a giggle because we, if we read something or see something or, you know, a commercial or, or maybe something we're watching and, and it tends to have something like that, that element in it, I'm like, oh, necromancy, necromancy. <laughs> so we, we often use that, that term in our house. But the word necromancy <laughs> derives from the Greek term nekros, which means dead, mm. and manatia, which means divination. Practiced since ancient times, necromancy is a form of summoning the alleged active spirits of the dead in order to get knowledge, mm. often about future <laughs> events. Ancestor worship, meanwhile, is the custom of, of uh, venerating deceased ancestors because they are still considered family and whose spirits can, it is believed, influence the affairs of the living. Mm -hmm. These pagan practices can be very attractive to those who believe in the immortal soul and who also miss their dead, deceived loved, uh, deceased loved ones. In this case, my friends, I... I, I you know, I grew up with this concept. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, I think I've told a little bit of my testimony. I haven't always believed the truth in regards to the state of the dead. Um, I remember growing up and hearing that all the time, you know, when my grandma day uh, died, you know, this concept of, oh, you know, don't weep, honey, your grandma's in a better place and she's looking down from heaven mm -hmm. upon you. And, you know, and, my, and I remember some of my family members like, oh, I went outside the other day and, you know, the sun beam just hit me right on my cheek and the wind just, whew, and I just knew it was mama. And, and so this idea that the dead continue to live on consciously after mm -hmm. death and that they have interactions and, 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 and uh, uh, dealings with the living. This is necromancy. And the lesson brings out that this can even turn into a form of ancestry worship, especially people. I have a family member who actually went and, and, and delved into the occult world mm -hmm. uh, through a uh, Ouija board. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I remember seeing the Facebook post. I spoke with my dad tonight. Mm. You know, uh, mm. she went up somewhere uh, north to one of the states and she was with some family. They pulled out a Ouija board and she was so excited because her dad had died of, you know, a couple of years before. Mm. And she finally got to speak to her dead dead wow. father. It sounded like him. Mm -hmm. it, you know, he said all the right things. Wow. And I just knew it was daddy. Mm. You know, this is ancestry worship. This is necromancy. And we mm. have to be very, very careful. You know, the Bible gives us an example of this. And, uh, and I believe the Bible gives, there's a reason why this example is only given, I believe, once in all of Scripture. Mm. And this is one of those passages and one of those instances in Scripture that gets brought up a lot, especially for an evangelist or a pastor who mm. preaches this message often. You're going to get the question about, what about the witch of Endor mm. and Saul's experience mm. when she brought up Samuel the prophet? Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel chapter yes. 28. And uh, we're not going to read all of the passage, even though the lesson wants you to read verses 3 to 25. And I encourage you, if you haven't read those passages or read all these verses here, uh, read 1 Samuel 28 verses 3 through 25. It really brings about and gives you the full context of what's going on. Mm. But basically, verse 3, I'm going to read verse 3, and then we're going to kind of set up the story and then read the latter verses here. Verse 3 says, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul, notice this, and Saul, the king at the time, had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Now, why did he do that? Mm. Why, did, why, did, why was Saul, the king of Israel, led to banish or put out all of the spiritists and the sorcerers and all of the, you know, the mediums? Because God had, had told him. God God had mm -hmm. made it very clear. I don't want my people delving into this you know, spiritualism and this mm -hmm. occult practices. And so he did that. He was faithful to follow the Lord's command at that point. Now, uh, so now the story goes on to tell us that Saul is, you know, the Philistines are breathing down his neck. He, it's not looking good for him in Israel. Mm -hmm. Saul has fallen so fallen, fall, fallen from grace so far and fallen into apostasy that he's been calling out to the Lord. The Lord's not listening to him. He's mm -hmm. going to the prophets. Hey, give me a message from the Lord. The prophets aren't listening to him. And so finally, uh, he falls so far that he finally goes back on what the Lord had mm. told him not to do. Yeah. And he decides to go to one of those mediums that he had banished. Mm. And so you pick up in verse 8. It says, so Saul disguised himself and put on, the, uh, put on other clothes. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman at night. And he said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. 
And then, of course, the, it goes on to say that the woman said to him, Look, you know, that Saul, uh, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why do you then lay a snare for my mm -hmm. life and cause me to die? I and mean, she's even understanding, mm -hmm. look, the king has spoken. And I, I, you're, you're, you're putting my life in danger here. Uh, but Saul goes on to tell her, No, 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 nothing's going to happen to you. Everything's okay. Uh, but it's interesting that when you get down here to verse 12, notice what it says here. Because uh, in previously in verse 11, she says, what, what sh Who shall I bring up for you? He says, Bring up Samuel for me. Me. And verse 11, uh, verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice and the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? Notice mm -hmm. Saul isn't seeing this. Mm -hmm. Saul can't see this for himself. He asking her, what do you see? Mm -hmm. So he's depending upon the, the, uh, the story or the, the testimony of this spiritist, this mm -hmm. medium. And, and he goes on to say, uh, and the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. Mm -hmm. And he said to her, what is his form? Now notice this is the key. There's a couple of context clues or a couple of clues in this passage that clearly show to us that even though it says the woman saw Samuel, mm -hmm. and even though it says that he said, bring up Samuel the prophet and that the spirit came up, you, there's a couple of clues in this passage that clearly communicate to us, this isn't Samuel. Mm -hmm. This is definitely not Samuel. First of all, we need to get that in our mind right now, my friends. I have so many Christians that come to me uh, you know, in, in my evangelistic uh, uh, evangelistic efforts. And, and I have so many people come to me, well, it says Samuel, and I believe what the Bible says. They brought up Samuel. But the Bible doesn't contradict itself. God does not contradict himself. Amen. And so in this case, we have to understand that we have to read it carefully, allow ourselves to rightly divide the word of truth and, and know and study deep to find out what is actually happening here. Mm. God does not contradict himself. Mm. So here's the clue here. It goes on to say, because he says, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up. This is verse 14, by the way, of 1 Samuel 28. An old man is coming up and he is covered with the mantle. And then notice here's the, here's the good clue right here. Oh, and yeah. Saul, notice he didn't see it. He didn't mm -hmm. see all this happening. He's mm -hmm. basing it off the witness of this medium. It says Saul perceived mm -hmm. that it was Samuel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. And Samuel, okay, it's still going on with the, with, the, with the words here. And Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And there's this conversation. But then you get down here as, as this, this supposed Samuel is instructing and, and conversating with Saul. It's interesting now in verse 19, as, as this spirit of Samuel is speaking, verse 19, it says, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And then notice this next clue here. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Mm. Did you catch that? Mm. You know this is not uh, the God speaking through this person, or you know this is not the real prophet Samuel, because that line right there completely contradicts all that we know about the state of the dead. Mm. The, the Spirit says to Saul, tomorrow you will be with me. No, 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 that contradicts what the Bible teaches. The Bible clearly teaches that the dead know not anything, anything right? They are asleep, they're unconscious in the grave, uh, and they don't have a clue of what's going on. But this spirit, and we know this is a, a deceiving spirit. This is, this is uh, the spirit of the devil. Deceiving Saul into believing that, oh yeah, you know, tomorrow you're going to die. And does the devil know bad things are going to happen to people? Yes. Does he have plans for bad things to happen of to course. people? Do you think the devil had plans for Saul? Of course he did. And so he was very much involved in this whole process. Mm -hmm. And so, it, but be in the process, oh, tomorrow you're going to be with me. In other words, your spirit and my spirit, and we're all just going to be here in the little spirit world together. Mm -hmm. But we know that that is not truthful. That mm -hmm. is not in harmony with what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. So my friends, uh, all in all here, you know, go study Leviticus chapter 19. Go study Leviticus chapter 20. Go study Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. The Bible is flooded mm -hmm. with examples of where God himself, for example, Leviticus 19, 31, God himself self says, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Mm. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Why Amen. does God not want you and me or any of his people going and uh, performing, mm. you know, being involved in seances and mm. occult practices and, you know, mediums and spiritists? Why? My friends, get on down there to Revelation 16 verse 14. What does mm. it say? Mm. For they are spirits of demons performing mm. signs and miracles which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world. Is the devil in the, in the business 
of deceiving people. Mm -hmm. Does he play by the rules? No, he does not. He will do anything. He will right. take the gloves off and he will not play by the rules. He'll do anything to deceive mm -hmm. as many people as possible. First Timothy chapter four, verse one. Now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. Necromancy, doctrine of demons. Mm -hmm. Reincarnation, doctrine of demons. Amen. This concept of you know life after death and near death experience, doctrine of demons. Mm -hmm. My friends, stick to what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. God is not the author of confusion. Mm -hmm. If we simply just go to the Word and allow God's Word to speak, trust in His Word, mm -hmm. and believe on Him, we will be safe. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, each one of you. That was very clear, Ryan. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. That leads perfectly into Thursday's lesson, personations and other appearances. I'm Jill Morricone. What's a personation? If you look at Wikipedia, it says it's primarily a legal term, meaning, catch this, to assume the identity of another mm -hmm. with the intent to deceive. Mm -hmm. That's what you were talking right, about. Right, right. Personations, assuming the identity of another, but with the intent to deceive. Personate is to fraudulently portray another person. Now let's look at spiritual personations. For that, we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. A couple of us on the panel have referenced this scripture, but we're going to read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we pick it up in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. You notice mm -hmm. this deception here. Transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. This is spiritual personation, mm -hmm. pretending to be an apostle of Christ, but actually being a false apostle. Deception is at the core of this personation. Verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. This is the ultimate spiritual personation, mm -hmm. not just evil angels, but Satan himself transforming himself, appearing to be holy, appearing mm -hmm. to be righteous, appearing to be angelic, when in fact he's the devil himself. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24 verse 5 says, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. You know, in the beginning, Satan wanted to be like God, did he not? Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 14. At the end, Satan will show himself that he is God. You mm -hmm. see that in 2 mm -hmm. Thessalonians 2 verse 4, talking about the man of sin. Mm -hmm. Who opposes? Satan opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now we know, of course, mm -hmm. he's not God, but this is personation. Mm -hmm. Great Controversy, page 624. As a crowning act in the great drama of deception, mm -hmm. Satan himself will personate Christ. Let's look at verse 15. We're in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15. Therefore, <coughs> it is no great thing. It's a common occurrence. If his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. We see this spiritual personation again, Satan's evil angels impersonating ministers mm -hmm. of righteousness. When you think about demonic personations, Ryan did a fabulous job talking about that. I know that we get letters at 3ABN, not every day. I'm aware of probably every couple weeks. Mm. And people write in and they say, my mother's visiting me and she's already deceased. Mm. Or yeah. my brother or my cousin yeah. and they show up in my house and in my mm. bedroom at night. Or mm -hmm. I'm having demonic oppression mm. in my home. Mm. I want deliverance. I know just talking on the phone. I know, Shelly, this happens in pastoral a great deal, but occasionally I'll get it on the phone. And sometimes when you hang up from a certain conversation, there's an oppression. Mm. There's a heaviness. Mm. And you know that there's demonic oppression yeah. going on. This is real. Yep. Personations, people hear knocking in their home mm. or oppression, that heaviness, that fear. 
how can we safeguard against demonic deception? Mm. I want to send the, spend the rest of my time on that. If we get to it, we'll have 11 takeaways from Ephesians chapter 6. So let's turn there. Ephesians chapter 6. This is how we can safeguard against demonic deceptions. And this is really putting on the armor of God. Mm, let's start that. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The first takeaway, the first focus is to understand God is stronger than Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan could not win against Jesus on this earth. He tempted him relentlessly from the beginning all the way to the cross and Jesus was stronger. Jesus mm -hmm. was victorious. Satan Amen. could not keep Jesus in the tomb. Mm -hmm. Jesus was victorious. God is stronger than Satan. Know that today. You don't have to be in fear of Amen. those demonic oppression or possession or what you're going through. God is stronger than Satan. The next verse, verse 11, Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number two, because of Christ, we are stronger than Satan. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean we're stronger, but it means because of Christ dwelling in us. First John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, mm -hmm. and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater Amen. than he who is in the world. Christ in us is stronger than anything that Satan can bring against Amen. us. Going back to Ephesians 6, verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Number three, recognize it's a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. It's not a physical battle. Mm -hmm. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Spiritual battles are spiritually fought. Don't think you're fighting against people. Mm. We're fighting against the devil himself. Mm -hmm. Recognize it's a spiritual battle. When mm -hmm. these oppression comes or that, it is a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number four, because it's a spiritual battle, do not become complacent. Mm -hmm. We think it's no big deal. Oh, I'll keep that video in my house. Well, it has a little after death experience, but it won't matter. Mm. I'll keep this book in my house and it really talks about that, but it doesn't matter. We uh, give an entrance for the enemy mm -hmm. to come into our home. Mm -hmm. When we allow books, movies, magazines that bring in demonic oppression. Mm -hmm. right. Ephesians 6 verse 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Ooh, mm -hmm. Take away number five. Mm -hmm. Engage in battle. Do something. Mm -hmm. Don't think that the battle is fought for you. It's mm. fought over you. Mm. Yep. There's a difference right. there. The battle is fought over your life and you have to take a stand. Mm -hmm. You have to make a decision today. I want to be on the Lord's side. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, make the decision again. I want to be on the Lord's side. Mm -hmm. good. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your waist girded with truth. If you've heard nothing else, this entire panel, I've heard it over and over. Mm -hmm. The word of God overcomes deception. Mm -hmm. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Don't allow emotions. Don't allow experience. Don't allow impressions or personations to sway you from what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. Gird yourself mm -hmm. with the truth in the Word of God. Keep going in verse 14. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, Takeaway number seven, Christ's righteousness overcomes deception. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clothe yourself in Christ's righteousness. Don't count on your own works to save you. Amen. Don't try to counteract Satan's deception with your own plan. Mm -hmm. Clothe yourself with his righteousness. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Takeaway number eight, knowledge of the gospel, it will overcome deception. Fight deception, fight the enemy with the knowledge of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Going down verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith mm -hmm. with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Takeaway number nine, faith in Jesus Christ, that overcomes deception. Mm -hmm. 
Faith overcomes Satan's temptations. Mm -hmm. Faith overcomes Satan's deceptions. Faith is essential mm -hmm. in the life of the Christian. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Mm -hmm. Take away number 10. Assurance of salvation will overcome deception. Know who you are, but most importantly, know whose you belong to. Mm -hmm. yes. Know who you belong to. Our final right. verse, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, mm. being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Our final mm. takeaway, number 11. Prayer, it overcomes deception. Mm -hmm. That's right. Not only you praying for yourself, but if you are dealing with demonic deception and oppression, gird yourself with truth. Mm -hmm. Stand firmly with faith, but above all, enlist prayer warriors to pray with you, and mm -hmm. God will set you free. Amen. 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 What a great way to close up because we need to make this practical. We've got right. to be able to arm ourselves and Amen. to stand. And of course, we stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a couple minutes for some closing thoughts. We'll start with Pastor Johnny Denzi. Thank you, Pastor James. I just want to leave you with Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word helps us to be able to decipher and de determine what is truth and what is error? Mm -hmm. Stick to the Word of God. Amen. amen and amen. I'm just going to repeat Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. There are no second chances. You determine your destiny. Now, will you receive the righteousness of Christ? Will you receive Him as your Savior and as your Lord? Mm -hmm. Amen. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, we often quote that because it talks about how to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. But a lot of people don't read the verse right before it. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19, within that context, it says, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, mm. who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? And then it says, to the law and to the testimony, if mm -hmm. they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Amen. Amen. I just want to say, if you're dealing with demonic oppression or possession, you're seeing personations, you're stressed and struggling, besides everything we talked about, you can call us at 3ABN. You can call us and we would love to pray with you and walk with you through that. Amen. Amen. NDEs, reincarnation, necromancy, standing in the spirit. Uh, I love this verse that Jesus gives us in Matthew where he says, man does not live by bread alone, yes. but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's really what we want to bring to you as we close out this session on end time deceptions, because it's the word of God that makes all the difference. It's made all the difference in my life and it can make all the difference in your life. Well, we are moving on in our lesson studies to lesson number 12. Next week's lesson is going to be the biblical worldview. And again, we're going to be talking about the Word of God and basing everything we teach on God's Word. So be sure and join us next week.